we thought it would be helpful just to ground our discussion today in, in some of the emerging research on what is increasingly being called the fourth industrial revolution or the second machine age, um, and specifically some of the key themes that are playing out, which are quite different from what we've experienced in previous revolutions where automation fundamentally transformed work and organizations. And the, the key word here, I would say, if you look at just some of the, um, some of the data points on this slide, are, um, are convergence. The, the convergence of multiple spheres of our personal lives, our physical lives, our biological or well-being lives, our work lives, our social lives, um, as a result of common technology platforms. Think of the impact of social media on all of those spheres of our lives, how they've converged. Think of the impact of digital technology um, and mobile technology specifically um, on all of those lives um, and how they've converged. The other aspect of convergence has been how digital media is rapidly becoming the pivot point for multiple industries. Every industry today is, um, is both digital and global. It doesn't matter if you're um, an auto manufacturer, it doesn't matter if you're a large global bank or an insurer, um, digital and global are very real features in, in how your business model is, is shifting and modulating to the new world of work. And what we're seeing are, are two key things that are fundamentally different about this industrial revolution versus the last. Um, the first being the speed of change. Um, as we went back and looked at the second and the third, um, we have not seen the convergence, the, both the growth of multiple technology platforms as well as the convergence of industries around these platforms at anywhere near the pace that we are seeing today. And then the second factor that is, is um, both exacerbating this pace of change is the lack of, of social institutions to enable and support society in adjusting to, uh, to this pace of change. If you go back to the second industrial revolution, you had the rise of large organizations as we know them today that really transformed how work was being done, that allowed society to adjust, that gave us the construct of jobs as we know them today. I think today we, uh, we, we seem to be found wanting when we look at the institutions we've traditionally relied on, whether it's education, whether it's government, whether it's the not-for-profit sector or, or companies. Um, all of those different stakeholders seem to be struggling. And when you look at the impact on work, as you'll see at the bottom, what we're seeing as a byproduct of both the pace of change as well as um, this issue of convergence is that many occupations and professions that we have seen you know, last for the last 120 odd years are rapidly uh, vanishing. We're seeing the, um, the half-life of many skill sets shrink dramatically and, and many of our children um, will probably have to retool themselves three to four times over, their over the course of their careers. Um, and so, again, you're seeing these, condi you know, these conditions for transformative change in, in both how organizations operate and how uh, work is, is being redefined. We went back and we looked at the, uh, the last, uh, last three industrial revolutions and uh, and forgive me for the, the history lesson. I'm, I'm not going to go through all of the detail, but we'll just call out um, some of the key features of the last two and the, stu the uh, striking contrast with how John and I are seeing work evolve um, in this fourth industrial revolution. Much of what we know about jobs and work um, really came about in the second industrial revolution where we had the likes of Henry Ford and General Motors and others aggregate discrete and disparate activities from cottage industries into an assembly line. Those assembly lines gave us uh, the jobs that we know about. Those jobs turned into uh, careers as, as people progressed through different levels at higher level with greater levels of responsibility and accountability. Um, those careers resulted in rewards that both lasted the duration of employment as well as post-employment in the case of pension plans and retiree medical programs. And, uh, and those jobs often lasted for a lifetime because uh, we had a steadily growing economy. We had um, stability uh, that allowed for talent and work to progress in a fairly organized way through this value chain. You fast forward to the, um, the, the, the third industrial revolution or, or what would be called the first machine age, 
And Nikeification was, was really kind of a theme there. And the reason being that Nike was the first company to figure out that the information asymmetry that had given us this, the assembly line construct, the efficiency of aggregating tasks into jobs and jobs into a process, and having all of those activities reside within the company, that that information asymmetry was increasingly being challenged and questioned as a result of the growth of technology, as a result of the introduction of the World Wide Web uh, as one key uh, example. And what it did was it gave us transparency and visibility into how we could take a process and pull it apart and have it done elsewhere with complete transparency into the cost and risk and capability and quality of that third party doing the work. The example being, you know, uh, us separating design and marketing from supply and logistics and manufacturing and having that done elsewhere. That heralded the emergence of the company, not just as, a, as the place where work was being done, but as the, uh, as the nexus for contracts. It also was the start of what we now know to be outsourcing. And um, a lot of analysis would show you that the average savings from what we got from outsourcing was about 25 to 30% over uh, the cost of labor within organizations. We jump to the fourth industrial revolution, and what we see is um, a, an acceleration of that concept of, of deconstruction. We, where in, the, in the third revolution, we deconstructed the process, and the fourth, what we're seeing as a result of mobile technology, sensors, AI, machine learning, um, further deconstruction of jobs themselves into tasks and activities. And the term Uberization now is uh, sort of, uh, I think, is, is fairly well known. Um, maybe, maybe not the most liked term, but certainly one that's, that's well known. And I think capture, it captures well the essence of some of the changes that we're seeing. Some of the analysis that we've done with, with various organizations uh, in contrast to the 25 to 30% savings from um, uh, from Nikeification are savings of 60 to 80 percent as a result of deconstruction and the application of alternative sources of work, whether it's human talent, whether it's employees, talent on a platform, AI or robotics. So um, a, fit, a step change from what we've uh, grown used to and a step change and in how we think about our organizations and work. So we'll talk more about the, the role of technology as we go through the next, uh, next hour or so, but uh, I'm going to hand it to John to, uh, to talk about uh, some of the other underpinning research that is foundational to um, our point of view and some of what we'll, we'll share. John? So thank you, Robin. Um, so I think, you know, when you hear these trends and that sort of thing, it's easy to think in terms of um, uh, extremes. So debates about whether all jobs will be replaced by robots and, and, uh, and, and you know, whether automation will make humans obsolete or, uh, and, and those are certainly good debates, certainly some social debates about displacement and the rapidity of change and whether we're going to have a sort of permanently, uh, uh, permanently retooling or maybe even permanently not qualified group in society. Um, uh, uh, you know, but I think, I, I think what I wanted to point out here is this is likely to be more of a topography than it is to be one extreme or another. Uh, this came up in some work that many of you are familiar with in a group called the CREATE group, and I'll refer back to that later with a website, where a group of um, chief HR officers and other thought leaders got together to sort of think about what would be the future trends affecting work and workers uh, in the next 10 years or so. And uh, we've talked about those before in webinars. We'll return to them in September. But I just wanted to list them for you. On the, on the left are the five trends that this group came up with to sort of capture some of the things that Robin is talking about as well as some others. Um, and, and then they, they distilled them into two dimensions. One of them uh, is this idea of democratization of work, and that certainly does mean that the, that work will be, be available from anywhere to anywhere, that work will look more like projects, that the, the power and the authority structure of work is changing, often shifting it more toward workers and less and away from, as Robin pointed out, traditional organization systems. Um, and then at the bottom, the idea of technological empowerment. And we'll talk more in a moment, Robin will, about the nature of how technology is changing. Uh, but the idea there is just the kind of exponential advancement of, of uh, storage, the exponential advancement of speed, uh, of personal devices, et cetera. A lot of writers are saying, you know, where we've made mistakes in the past is not 
uh, is underestimating the ability of technology to catch up to new ideas. You know, the, the notion, for example, that you could pull out a handheld device, type in any term you want and see every piece of writing about it that's ever been written uh, was pretty much, you know, I think it would have been seen as, you know, heresy. In fact, a lot of writers said it was absolutely impossible as, as recently as even uh, the 1990s. Um, so technological empowerment means that we're probably uh, underestimating the potential for, for technology to affect things. So when you put those two together, you get this two by two uh, uh, matrix on the right. And Martina, if you want to switch slides to the next one, this is a version of that that I put together for uh, a piece in Harvard Business Review. Thank you, Martina. Um, and so again, I think the, the lesson, one of the lessons that I wanted to point out here is this is not so much a rush where every job is going to be uh, deconstructed, every job is going to be automated, et cetera. It really is a much more nuanced and much more interesting situation for HR and for the future of leadership because it's likely that work, some work is gonna stay very traditional. Uh, other work is going to be technologically empowered, to moving to the right on the bottom, uh, but not necessarily that different in terms of, uh, the, of how we get the work, of the power shift, of whether or not it's deconstructed. And then if you move up, you have a set of options where work becomes what this group called more democratized, uh, more transparent, more deconstructed into projects and tasks, more available in a global market uh, where workers can come and go and workers have a great deal of power to choose how they work and who they work for. Uh, and and that, that gives you two boxes in the top, one of them on the left where we do that with pretty much today's technology and the one on the right where we do it with bo both uh, new technologies and also this uh, democratized work ecosystem. Um, so one of the invitations here is, and something that we'll, we'll do kind of as an exercise and as we look at our, our presentation in September would be to think about where the work in your organization falls today and where the work in your organization is starting to have, let's call it like friction points or stress points that might suggest that it ought to be categorized in one of the three yellow boxes um, uh, in order for you to, to move on and to deal with some of those work changes. Now, um, so, so having said that, having invited you to sort of step back and think about the work in your own organization and where it falls in this, then we can, that, that begins to open up this idea that we talked about in Lead the Work of work being deconstructed into projects and work being sourced through a bunch of new and different kinds of alternatives. Um, and, and in our past work, what we talked about was the way to dial up those alternatives. So we, we talked about the idea that you may need to deconstruct the work at a certain level into projects. You then may need to think about your organization and how permeable you want to make it, whether you reach out to everyone in the universe or whether you're very careful about reaching out to only a couple of organizations. And then we talked about creativity in terms of the reward rewards that people get, uh, you know, how quickly you can reward them, uh, how specifically you can reward them to a certain task, whether that reward goes beyond money to things like sense of purpose, et cetera. So that was all about sourcing work in, uh, through humans and, and alternative ways that humans will engage with people who are seeking work, let's call them organizations. What we've started to work on now and what we'll bring forward in September is adding to that sourcing option uh, a number of different types of automation. And so I'm gonna turn it back to Robin now to talk about some of the evolution of automation and particularly how we're beginning to see automation affecting work. And for you, what I want you to think about is the power, I think, of this idea of um, deconstructing work thinking about the boundary, the reward, and the work as, as now permeable and dialable, and then what would happen if we added the, the application of automation to those deconstructed, more permeable, more differentially rewarded kinds of ideas. So Robin, with that, I'll turn it back to you to give us um, some information about your work on how, how uh, uh, automation is advancing and how that's affecting work and jobs. Great, thanks, John. And before we t uh, d drill into automation, just a couple of additional points around what John has talked about as it relates to the democratization of work and some just some useful um, anecdotes to b bolster some of the um, uh, elements of the model that John talked to. When, when we wrote Lead the Work, um, you know, we did a drill down, as some of you know, into the emerging wor world of talent platforms, of alternative ways in which work was getting democratized. And what has been fascinating since the time we wrote the book is to look at the growth and scale with which alternative uh, means for work, 
being done by people has actually accelerated. When we looked at Top Coda back um, in 2010, it was 6,000 people, it was some 700,000 people when we published the book, and today it's over a million of the world's best technologists, developers, and, and coders um, who, who choose to work on this platform. We've seen um, contingent talent grow from earning, on average, about uh, two million people. Uh, two, million, two million people made about $100,000, in excess of $100,000 as freelancers in this country in 2011. And that number grew in 2015 to three million um, people making in excess of $100,000. Um, we've seen these talent platforms accelerate from a handful of highly specialized platforms to over 500 today, um, and with numbers approaching the, uh, the tens of millions of, of uh, individuals on those platforms. Upwork has some 13 million people on it. So just a, uh, some data points to echo and I think uh, accentuate some of the points that John has just made about the democratization of work. If we uh, shift gears now and drill into uh, automation, and this has been an area that uh, we've spent a lot of time looking at. Uh, we've written a number of HBR articles about this, and as John mentioned, we are working in our next book um, on the specific issue of how artificial intelligence and automation are transforming work and accelerating that, that concept of Uberization. Many of us have seen how um, AI has, uh, has accelerated as natural language processing as sensors have come into play. Um, we've seen how Echo and Siri and uh, Google at home have transformed our personal lives. And we're starting to see that in the workplace as well as we think of concepts like Siri at work playing out. Um, we're seeing rapid change in terms of the shift from recognition AI to cognitive intelligence where um, we've got machines that are able to sort of anticipate some of our needs and start to uh, act and respond um, uh, in, in that anticipation. Think of how driverless cars have played out. Uh, we are still a long way from general artificial intelligence, but it has been truly astounding to see how um, DeepMind, which, is because, which has rapidly become the poster child for the power of artificial intelligence after it beat the world champion at the game Go, how it has further developed and started to develop transference in learning. One of the big challenges with AI has been when I teach a machine something, I can only teach it one thing. And for it to do something else, it has to unlearn everything that I've taught it, as opposed to knowing the bits to retain and the bits to learn uh, that are new. And we're starting to see some significant progress in that understanding of what are some core skills that the machine needs to retain and add to. Uh, and DeepMind has been sort of advancing some of that as well. If we drill into the, uh, the different types of AI, um, there are uh, three core types of automation that are transforming work. And um, it's fascinating to see them both mature and get applied with, uh, within the context of, context of organizations around the world. Um, the first is robotic process automation. Think of that as being automation without any intelligence. What's intriguing about RPA, um, as it's known, is it has reached a level of maturity that is allowing for widespread deployment. Um, it, its impact is really one of efficiency because it takes on many of the traditional routine, um, some would often, some would call mindless activities that many of us may, may need to engage in. So the ability to sort of draw data from an Excel spreadsheet, link it to unstructured data from Outlook to data from Oracle. In the, in the good old days, we would have defaulted to thinking that we needed to build the world's best database to be able to have all of that done in the back end. RPA takes all of that complexity away and says, you don't have to build the world's best database. You can actually have that data reside in multiple systems, and it can actually integrate it within what's called the presentation layer. One great example of RPA in practice is how um, work, compliance work that is done in many financial institutions as a result of uh, regulations like know your customer. So today we have an analyst that would be paid about $125,000 looking at um, a loan application. 
She needs to pull data down from the bank's um, internal systems to know the customer. She might go to an Experian and a TransUnion to pull data, the credit file. She's going to be going onto social media and a whole host of other systems to build up this mosaic, if you will, or this composite image of this individual and their credit risk or credit worthiness. We can write an RP, uh, a, a bot today in RPA that pulls all of that data. And some of our analysis has shown us that if you take away the judgment of the analysis and if you look at just the routine aspects of that work, um, we can do that for under $20,000 relative to the cost of the analyst of $125,000. So the efficiency gains from RPA are huge. Cognitive automation is where there is the, probably the most excitement. Think of this as the combination of, of um, intelligence with sensors, with um, processing capability like natural language processing. This is where AI is able to sort of engage in the non-routine and the creative. Think of what um, AlphaGo did with, um, with the game Go, the ability to continuously learn from existing examples, to learn and to extrapolate. Um, this is, uh, the impact of this is, is expected to be truly um, uh, significant because of the, its ability to impact non-routine cognitive work that's being done. And the last category is um, social robotics or the interaction of human beings with robots. Think of it as a combination of three things. Um, robots or equipment that we've traditionally um, had and known in, in think of a, of a car. Couple that with sensors that uh, assess where the, the car is, uh, that assesses where a human being might be, where another vehicle or an obstacle might be, and the intelligence to combine the input from a sensor and link that to the, the actual motion and actions of the vehicle. Driverless cars being the classic example of um, what we would call social or mobile, ro mobile robotics. Lots of routine activity, but the collaboration um, on a dynamic basis between a human being and a machine. John and I are going to actually explore this in a lot more detail at our session in September, if that is not yet more, more motivation to join us. Um, what's exciting if we, I talked about the potential of cognitive automation. What's exciting about cognitive automation is its ability to truly transform work. And you can see the three things that it does that it could potentially do. And I want to give you a very specific example um, of how it's playing out in, in one industry. So think of insurance and something that all of us can relate to, uh, perhaps uh, not, not an experience we want to have too often, but if you have an automobile accident, um, in the old days or today perhaps even, um, the way that accident would be handled is you would um, report, call in to your, uh, your uh, insurance, insurer, You'd report the claim. You'd get a, um, a claims adjuster who would come out and look at the vehicle. She might, you know, assess all of the damage, go back to the office, take a couple of days to, you know, do her research to figure out what the cost of the claim is. You would then have the your body shop. You'd take your vehicle to the preferred body shop. There would be the inevitable negotiation between the body shop and the claims adjuster. All in all, a fairly painful, time-consuming process. Today, um, the combination of sensors and AI um, and mobile technology have completely transformed that process. Um, as many of you know, um, it, well, all of us have cell phones. Virtually every cell phone has a camera. You, if you have an accident today, you take a picture, and that picture gets uploaded onto your insurer's databases. AI immediately scans that data, it links the profile of your vehicle, it knows the year of the vehicle, it's able to look at what does that bumper on a 2015 Mercedes E-Class actually cost? What does that le this level of damage look like? What have we paid out on claims when this accident has happened? What is the cost of a claim in this particular neighborhood? Which are the what have we paid out to these various body shops who are authorized to work on our vehicles? So the combination of the hardware and the software with the data, um, and if you think of now, now what then happens is AI determines the claim, it communicates the number to the body shop. The adjuster might look at it just to do some sense checking to make sure that 
it, it, it fits and, and the technology is not sort of not gone off the rails, but the role of the adjuster now is as the human guardrails, if you will. But that process now goes from potentially two weeks down to a matter of hours um, with a level of accuracy that is absolutely unprecedented. Um, and it's resulting in not just new insights and a transformed process, but the ability to actually develop some new products and services um, in terms of um, the technology actually being able to use this data to feed into how um, insurance is priced. Uh, some of you may know that um, most uh, auto insurance is priced based on credit reports, which is a talk about a blunt instrument. But today, with this sort of data being generated from these sensors, our ability to price on a prospective basis is greatly enhanced. So uh, hopefully a useful example of, um, of how AI is transforming one very real experience for many of us. And for those of you with teenage drivers like me, um, I think you may relate to that example perhaps a lot more than you'd care to. I know I can. Um, the, if we shift from the AI itself into or automation into how it's affecting jobs, one of the things that has fascinated John and I is to look at how um, various researchers, academics, consultants have looked at the impact of technology on work. This, as some of you may recognize, was a study done by the Oxford Martin School, and it looked at the impact of automation on work in the United States. And the prediction was that um, by 2025, 47% of jobs that existed in the United States in 2010 would be eliminated. Uh, John and I um, vehemently dis disagree with this, and in large part because the job is not the relevant unit of analysis when we think of the app, how automation will transform work. Um, what is much more relevant is the deconstruction of those jobs into activities and the understanding of how susceptible those various activities are to automation, to the types of automation that I just talked about. This is a piece of analysis from, from McKinsey that we think is, is much more realistic and, and in, certainly in line with our perspective. And it looks at the susceptibility of different types of work that might make up a job and how susceptible that work might be to automation. So on the far right are things that are routine, things that are highly predictable, be they physical or manual or cognitive, things that are repetitive which we can teach the machine to do you know, RPA, taking on some of the data processing work that's done by that compliance analyst. The data collection that RPA does that saves us from manually having to enter data from Excel into, uh, into Oracle or vice versa. Now, as we move to the left, what you see are the things that are less susceptible to the automation as it, in its current state or form. Things that are unpredictable. Um, you know, there are elements of that that could be automated automated, things that, are, that require lots of human interaction. AI could certainly supplement and augment the human capability, but probably not replace it like we would see with the items in blue on the right. And that, that conundrum is, is one that we are spending a lot of time on. We've got some great case studies that we'll be sharing in September of how different organizations are looking at the deconstruction of some of their, their, pivotal, uh, their pivotal roles across their businesses and thinking about how do we make the most of that human capability. When we look at the research, what we see is the, the continued evolution of work along those lines um, of, you know, separation of what's routine from what's non-routine. This is some data from the Federal Reserve and, and the Census Bureau. And essentially what it shows you is over the course of the last 40 years or so, um, a steady plateauing of anything that is cognitive whether it's routine or, cog or of anything routine, whether it's cognitive or manual. And what's growing in demand are, in terms of jobs, are, are jobs and work that emphasize the non-routine, the things that are creative, the things that are, uh, require empathy, that require innovation. Um, as an example, in, in Great Britain, the uh, demand for nurses, for skilled nurses, has gone up 800% in the last couple of years. So think of that as um, non-routine manual, if you will, or, or, or certainly non-routine cognitive for certain types of nursing work. And what, is, um, what has also accelerated is the demand for unskilled, 
home care helpers, um, non-routine manual work. Um, those are things, certainly there's been advances in social robotics with, um, um, to su supplement home care nurses, but the work of that um, home health care aid, the empathy, the connection with the individual, the care, um, the understanding of, of meaning uh, are things that I think the AI and automation are a long way from, uh, from replacing. So, Robin, if I might, if I might interrupt here, and it, I think that slide might be, or this one, might be the right place to think about this. I, I don't know if you noticed the, the question from Bruce in the chat box, but but perhaps you can begin to work this in. Um, he he mentions the meaningfulness of work, and mm -hmm. specifically whether there are any trends in work meaning, and is that something that's being measured or planned or correlated as all of this automation takes place. Now, I know I don't expect you to provide an expert answer with lots of data, um, but it does, it does raise an interesting question looking at the previous graph about what sorts of work seem to be going away or, or reducing as a result of automation and what kinds of work are increasing as a result of automation. So as you go, and particularly, you know, in this graph or the robot graph, maybe you want to comment a little bit about that and what you're seeing in, in your own work in the field and with the companies you work with. Is there any attention to this idea of meaningfulness? Uh, at one extreme, is it getting completely ignored uh, and assumed away, or are there companies that may be thinking pretty deeply about what's, what meaning is left as work becomes more democratic and automated? Yeah, thank you, John. I had not noticed the, the, the question pop up, but I think it's an excellent one. And, and um, let me give you just a, a couple of data points on that, Bruce. Um, when we do our engagement surveys around the world, one of the things that we often uh, hear from, uh, from the employees and contingent talent that we survey is what, what really engages them um, are the things that, where they're, they're problem solving, where they're engaging with colleagues, where they're engaging in non-routine activities, et cetera, the things that maybe are most disengaging are the, the routine, repetitive things that don't really sort of uh, connect them to the organization, don't really connect them to the customer that many can often perform in their sleep as a result of that. So on the one hand, this is an opportunity for, for us to not just deconstruct, um, because that, that some might view that as, as only having a downside, but as John and I have talked about, the potential reconstruction and recreation of new jobs as we deconstruct and automate, how do we reconstruct the non-routine, the, the uh, human interactions into something that's of a higher value? <laughs> so, so I think that's a, a key part of, of, you know, sort of what we're seeing. Um, you know, and certainly a number of organizations um, are, ha are, have rapidly picked up on this as they think about your point about measurement, when they look at their engagement surveys of really drilling down into the aspects of the work that engage the most versus the ones that don't. I, I think that's one particular opportunity. Um, I think others have, um, others have continued to look at work. Um, but, I, but I do think, you know, as progressive as some companies are, others continue to be hamstrung by their inability to move away from that fundamental unit of analysis or the way we denominate the problem, which is, as, as, as we've mentioned here, you know, moving beyond the job to think about the work and the tasks and activities versus starting at the level of the job because the problem with the job is that there is so much noise in it that it's difficult to sort of really understand what is the stuff that gives real meaning versus what doesn't. So just, just one, one particular uh, thought on that. Um, yeah, in terms that's helpful, of Robin. Meaning, meaning yeah. for work. Thank you. I might, I just might add a couple. I think Robin is, I think Robin is onto something, and I guess we're both pretty uh, enamored of this idea that when you pull work apart out of the job description, you really do see some patterns that are not apparent when you don't. We've, we've, we've focused a lot on patterns about productivity, cost, risk, etc. Um, and but I think that idea of pulling the work apart and then asking what really is meaningful here, what is the source of meaningfulness in the work. And, and as Robin said, I think what you find in a lot of jobs is that there's a great number of things that people would say, if this was automated tomorrow, it really wouldn't change and it might even increase the meaningfulness of my work. Robin will get to that next when he talks about the augmentation of people with automation. Um, so I, I, if, you know, I think we, we see a lot of debate, and I've written about this, Robin has as well, around things like, well, the, the worker has 
being displaced by a robot and the, the job is going away, you know, whether it's coal miners or uh, manufacturing workers, et cetera. And, the, you know, the rhetoric around that really does hinge around the job itself. Um, and I think, well, we don't want to be um, overly optimistic or a Pollyanna kind of approach. There's going to be displacement. People are going to indeed need help with this. Bill Gates has suggested taxing the robots. So if you, if you robotize something, you pay a tax and that tax goes into a fund to help, I would, I would hope, reconfigure and retool both the work and the workers, hopefully to something that's more meaningful. Uh, platforms provide an opportunity for experts who've been displaced to become not the operator anymore because the operation of the machine shifts to other workers or even automation, but perhaps the trainers of automation or even the remote trainers of workers who are working on that machine, which makes them a global resource and gives them a global work market, for example. Um, so I think there's, it's a really great question. And, you know, for our, for our listeners, the exercise of saying, what if I took apart some of these jobs and said, what's the meaningful part? And then I asked myself, what could be the effect of automation on enhancing that? Uh, rather than just a, just a focus on displacement, um, et cetera. Um, and so, so, Robin, thank you. I'm just going to mention a couple of other questions, and then I'm going to have you move on. But we did get a question about the implications of all this for the current educational systems um, and, um, the, and the idea of employers needing to manage how governments define employee, 1099, W-2, all that sort of thing. So I'll, I'll encourage you to move on, but, but we'll put those education questions and the whole idea of public policy and regulation into the mix as we go forward. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thanks, John. And, and you know, just, uh, and I'll, we'll, we'll touch on both of those uh, as we talk about the broader implications here. You know, we asked ourselves, are we, as we look at this rapid pace of automation, are we approaching peak human? And some of you may know that the phrase comes from peak horse when the horse in 1910 ceased to be this engine of, of, of our economy, you know, no longer the primary thing that plowed the fields or, or provided transportation, et cetera, and became more a, a thing of leisure. Um, and what we found were, you know, certainly examples where um, you know, where the task is the job, um, certainly AI being applied to that, whether it's robo-advisors and banking, whether it's um, the potential elimination of uh, truck driver uh, tasks or jobs uh, as a result of, of automation there. It does raise some significant questions about um, how we are educating. Um, I, I, and I think um, Alvin Toffler's great quote from the, the early 70s, of the illiterate of the 21st century not being those who can't read and write, but those who can't learn, unlearn, and relearn, I think is particularly relevant here when we think about how automation will, will not just eliminate and, um, and take on certain tasks, but potentially create some new tasks and new activities for, uh, for humans. Um, so, so I think education is going to be one that sort of needs to be addressed. Um, and, you know, one example that we've, we've looked at in terms of the transformation of work is, is how um, cancer has been treated and the rapid use of IBM Watson, for example, to augment the human surgeon in, in diagnosis, the use of different robots in augmenting human capability uh, during the um, surgery, and then shifting the emphasis for the human being towards the back-end care and uh, treatment of the individual. John, did you want to talk about how all of this plays out with regard to the organization? That's great. Thank you very much, Martina. And Martina, I'll warn you, I may have you drop back to that slide Robin was just on in just a second. Um, there's, a, there's a couple of implications, I think, of, of what Robin has been talking about. Um, uh, it, you know, in terms of, so, so sorry, Martina, let's go to the next one. Thank you. Sorry for everybody for a little vertigo there. So this is a diagram that came from the work that it's a little bit modified, the work that Robin and David Creelman and I did. Um, and and I, it's an overcharacterization, but I think a good one for teaching purposes. Um, I think it's, it's, uh, it's a good idea for organizations and HR and leaders outside of HR to sort of imagine the top graph being the default way that we often think about things. We have a big, bold boundary called the organization, and we're pretty clear on what that means. It means we have people inside of it that are, that are called employees that have employment contracts or they walk across our boundary and they, uh, they receive, you know, they, they receive temporary kind of employment status uh, or something like that. 
Um, so pretty traditional. And, and I think what, what we're saying here is that, that one of the things that happens is that boundary becomes more like a cloud, much more gray. Uh, the idea of who's in and who's out really does become subject to a little different definition. You know, if you get 30 or 50 or 70 percent of your work done by people who come in on project work and you have a significant affiliation with a platform like an Upwork or a Tongle or something like that, then does that mean that those people are actually now included in your quote organization? There's been a lot of writing lately, a lot of rediscovery really of the concept of organization as fundamental to a competitive advantage and as a needed augmentation to just thinking about the individuals. And that's all very true. I'm, I'm delighted to see that rediscovery happening. I think, however, the definition of an organization is going to go way beyond what we usually think of as lines and boxes and, and boundaries. So what I've added in this one is those little robots and those little augmented brains. So that what we're suggesting, and as we go forward to, to the September session, what we're, how we're going to extend that, would be that we need to think about automation as well as a part of that ecosystem. Uh, and so if you look at this diagram, one of the real challenges for the field and for the field of human resources, for leadership in general, et cetera, is how we're going to conceive and then systematize optimizing all of these different alternatives. So we can envision a world, if you think about going back to the, the slide before, uh, if you think about these trends uh, in terms of, of peak human, in terms of now these are examples where we, we augment doctors with, with AI, we, we create robot advisors, et cetera. Um, we, we have game playing computers that can champion it go. If you think about those things as tools, for now optimizing this world that's shown on the next slide. It really, so go ahead and go to that one, Martina. It really does open up some interesting ideas about how artificial intelligence might help to scan and codify and, and uh, optimize the mixture of all those ways that you might get work done and bring it together with all the kinds of work that you need to get done. One can imagine a device where you would basically just describe the work you need done, and that device would understand it, it would codify it, and it would then compare it to all the different ways that you might get that work done, whether it's freelancers or, or gamers or robots or AI or augmented humans, and guide you through uh, the kinds of options that, that, that you might have. Now, that app might be in the hand of a leader, uh, it might be in the hand of an HR leader, and we're beginning to see the evolution of some of these um, some of these in innovations. Uh, and we're we're working on a program in September to bring some of those to you, where organizations are actually beginning the rudimentary process, let's say, of of beginning to codify and put all of this together. Some organizations present leaders with uh, at P and G, they call it a work mall that has regular full-time employment, yes. It has contractors, yes. Those are the anchor stores, so to speak, of them all. But in between, there are a bunch of other alternatives. And the idea is to at least be in a dialogue that opens up those alternatives. Uh, and Robin and I would say that that's going to hinge pretty deeply on technology and other systems that are going to help us deconstruct and then reconfigure and then optimize the work. So again, just a little graphic here to say if, if the new world that's coming is going to be a much more complex but also option-filled world of different work options, um, is, is there going to be some co connection actually between all of these things and HR? Um, uh, and so, so, and that, and I think that goes also to some of the discussions here about government and, and regulation. To be sure, I think everyone would agree that uh, the government regulations, the definitions of how work gets done, the emphasis on employment, the debate about co-employment, 1099 W-2, all of those things are important, but they really reflect the top box. They really reflect questions about where do you fall inside or outside that boundary. Often they reflect the presumption that the only good work is work that happens in a very traditional way with an employment contract inside the boundary of the organization. Plenty of research to suggest that alternative types of work can be fulfilling, rewarding, et cetera. They can also be very exploitive. So that's, that's an area for HR to step into uh, and see if we can minimize the exploitation and maximize the empowerment. Um, I think we, we have yet to see really um, we see debates about it, um, but we have yet to see really a coherent policy approach to looking at the bottom graph. 
where the organization boundary is a cloud and where the, the right, perhaps the right concept of work is much more about a deconstructed set of work elements that we optimize. Um, so plenty of work for, this, this is the kind of work that all the smart people in the audience will do. Uh, and then if you're me, I get to talk to you and write about it and all of you say that was really a smart idea. So I, I'll, I'll again perpetually thank all of you for, for helping me uh, do that and, and Robin being one of those folks that's very smart and has the, the courtesy to let me write about it. So some interesting kinds of things on the horizon here. And again, I, I would just suggest that number one, this graph may help think about it. And number two, we can think about technology actually helping with these issues um, themselves. Um, so, so I see we've got a couple more questions coming in about, from Jennifer in particular, about specific things like training and education and where should it, where should it focus if the future things are connectedness and empathy. So let me move on to a couple of final slides uh, and then we'll, we'll leave one more opportunity for questions in, in a few minutes here. Um, this is, again, a diagram that has appeared in a number of the books that I've written. It appeared most recently in a book with Robin and David. Uh, pretty easy idea. In the middle, the circle represents the activities of traditional HR. We might call that the HR life cycle or the talent life cycle, everything from planning to attracting to selecting all the way around to separating. In, in the lead the workbook, we talked about deconstructing the assignment, uh, creatively uh, thinking about the rewards and permeating the organization. And we suggested you can go around that circle and each part of it actually takes on a new meaning. I think we can also now, so in other words, sourcing looks very different if you say our sourcing includes an ecosystem of workers, many of whom may never be our employees. Very different from saying sourcing is recruiting people to become employees and take an employment contract. Rewarding looks very different <clears throat> if you say our rewards will include all kinds of creative things like sense of purpose, employment brand, uh, uh, the, the opportunity for, full, for fulfillment, et cetera, well beyond money. Um, and, and one of our questions had to do with development. Um, if we have a generation looking at their screens who struggle to interact with each other uh, in person, how do we work to adjust training and education so that we can keep the empathy and bring in the non-technical skills in this new environment? Now, I don't have a perfect answer, Jennifer, but I think that's a beautiful question to open up a discussion about how will these automation trends affect HR itself and the way that leaders and HR professionals actually go about constructing and implementing the work relationship. I did a webinar yesterday with Harvard Business Review that, that some of you may have seen and it'll be available in recording. The center will let you know how to get it about this question. And so if we move to the next graph, all I've done here is superimpose, let's call it AI, <clears throat> on the practice of human resources. So Jennifer, you know, if we think about the idea of learning and we've already got distributed learning and learner-centered learning uh, where someone can go out and get a YouTube video uh, of someone who knows how to do something and watch that video, um, <clears throat> you know, we already have a world in which there's a community being formed with everything from training channels to favorite trainers to rated trainers um, that, is, that is really based on, on a, a virtual community, that, that that community doesn't really require being in person to together and it's getting more sophisticated, et cetera, one can imagine that one might say, well, the trainer of the future is going to be this augmented uh, super trainer that is going to have AI right at their side, AI that is constantly scanning the best sources of learning, the best, uh, the most accurate and highly rated sources of learning, and that learner is going to be able to navigate that community and that ecosystem augmented now with artificial intelligence as well as cloud-based systems, et cetera. Um, there are, you know, speaking of learning, it's very interesting how we'll define learning. I, I mentioned this yesterday. We, we talk about um, smart machines and we think about an IBM machine playing another machine in chess or Go or something like that. We think about machines playing humans or humans playing humans. Think about chess. But there's a new kind of chess sport that has emerged called freelance chess or centaur chess, like the, the mythical animal that was half horse, half man. And there are players that play augmented by a smart machine. So if you're playing centaur chess, you and your augmented AI uh, machine 
play someone else who has their augmented AI machine, and the trick is to know when to ignore the machine and make your own move and when to go by what the machine says. And it turns out that the best players at Centaur Chess are not the chess masters because the chess masters rely too much on their own brain. It's all, they can also play better than a machine by itself because the machine doesn't see everything perfectly. So that just raises for me the idea if we impose automation on top of this new world of HR, what kinds of things might we be able to do as HR leaders or you be able to do as HR leaders, but also how might we turn control and democratize things like learning and rewards, et cetera, to leaders or to the people seeking work or seeking learning, et cetera? How much could AI and, and uh, augmented technology really do that with um, uh, in, in this new environment? So again, I know that's not a perfect answer to many of you that asked about um, you know, some of, the, some of the specific HR ones, but I might invite you to just think about that. What are the examples from the world of automation in other areas that might be brought to bear on our world in HR? And then finally, just a couple of slides to, uh, to kind of finish off and, and, and uh, maybe stimulate some, a little bit of discussion. I'm gonna, move, I'm gonna recur, return now to this project CREATE, which was a, really an upwelling of volunteer effort by a number of CHROs, about 100 people now. You can find details about it at the website create.net. That one of the things that group came up with, in addition to the five forces I talked about earlier, was that this new world of HR will create new roles. So uh, where, where today we might have recruiters and, and, uh, and hiring managers, we have in the upper right-hand side a global talent scout convener and coach who is always convening the work ecosystem. The questions have really gone to that bottom right role. How much should the HR profession be an activist about changing regulations, about rethinking the definitions of things like employment, et cetera. Um, I just talked about the notion of integrator uh, in, in, a, in this group, kind of people thought about the idea that you'd, you'd be looking out to places like IT, to information engineering, et cetera, bringing those people in to be data and talent uh, integrators. And then a lot of your questions have been about fulfillment and work meaningfulness. Uh, the group kind of talked about the idea of a virtual culture architect there at the top so that we architect the many different cultures that we have. We, we are as good at uh, things like meaningfulness and culture as an architect would be about seeing deeply into the architecture. And this graph kind of inspired Robin and his team to, to, go to, to go to the next graph and think about how all these roles might change in the world of AI. And Robin, I might give you a minute to just take us around this, maybe a couple of the highlights that strike you here. Yeah, just and maybe I'll just focus in, John, on, on the two that I think are most interesting as we reflect back on, on, on the visual that you talked to about the change in the organization towards mm -hmm. more of an ecosystem. You know, the one question we, we get asked all the time is how does this now sort of Uberized world actually work play when we've spent so much time talking about culture? And I, and I, and I think the way we think about it is in the past we would have defined culture as ending at the walls of the organization. and encompassing our employees. Today, in this much more distributed world, it becomes more about the set of shared experiences and connections, whether it's between employee and organization, between AI provider and organization, or you know, individual uh, independent contractor and employee, and having, um, you know, actually orchestrating those sort of remote cultures is going to take some significant and concerted work. So that's one position that we see emerging. And I think as part of that, as the, the whole sort of infrastructure that connects us becomes much more virtual, um, the cyber ecosystem and, and designing that becomes a key part of it, in much the same way we might have designed office spaces years ago. We might have designed the physical layout. You know, how do we design the, the sort of cyber architecture? And how do we ensure that as more and more of our world sort of moves into that um, the ether, if, for want of a better phrase, we've got the protocols and the security, and I, I saw that John asked the question about IP rights and ownership, um, our ability to protect against the um, uncontrolled movement of data and intellectual property beyond the ecosystem becomes really important. Um, so I think just a couple of roles, and we'll talk about some of the others, um, I think, when we get together, as well as some other emerging uh, uh, types of work that we see coming about. Thank John, you, Robin. You want... and, 
Yeah, thanks, Robin. I won't go into a lot of detail here. This is a slide I often use to sort of summarize some of this. You know, we've talked about the boundaryless work ecosystem. Uh, I think a big implication of that is that the solutions to this are going to span across different functions. Those roles might get created much more as a as a composite of other disciplines. Might be uh, it might be uh, corporate uh, relations or communication in in terms of activism. It might be IT and systems in terms of uh, systems integrators. Uh, et cetera. So, th so there, this idea that we need to look outside of the traditional HR function, that this is going to be a mashup of lots of different areas, I think that's even more true as we think about applying things like AI and augmented humans to the HR tasks themselves. And then the idea that, that, it, that our systems may have the, the may, may hold, hold the key to helping people learn about this, that, that as we, that, that it's in those systems where we have our data, where we define things, where we show people reports and other things, where we, they interact with all those things to learn how to think about the tasks they need to do and what employment means, whether it's a performance management application, a training application, a, a compensation application, those systems are powerful teachers. They show people how we think they ought to think about this stuff. And so it's worth thinking about how do we augment our systems to teach some of these new ways of thinking. How do our systems present options in a way that cause leaders and employees and others to think a bit out of the box? Um, so with that, I can see that we have about, we're about three minutes to the hour, Martina. Uh, uh, you, maybe you want to bring us to a close. Uh, I don't see any new questions coming through on the chat line. Hopefully we've managed to at least address some of them, if not answer all of them. So maybe, Martina, I'll turn it back to you to kind of conclude the session today. Thank you, Robin. Absolutely. Thanks so much to you both. Um, you'll see here that if you are interested in joining us in Chicago on September 14th to dive much deeper into this topic, um, please visit our website, which is ceo.usc.edu. Um, everyone will also receive the recording of this webinar. Um, and with that, um, just a final thank you to John and Robin and wishing everyone a great day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.